Hi, welcome everybody to the Light Reading Executive Spotlight Q&A. This is Light Reading sponsored podcast series exploring the companies and the technologies moving the industry forward. My name is Sterling Perrin. I'm an analyst with Heavy Reading, focused on transport networks. And today I'm joined by Francisco Santana with Siena. Hi, Francisco. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Sterling. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Great to be talking to you again uh, about uh, one of my favorite topics, 5G transport. Um, actually, the main topic for today is going to be the results from the 2024 5G Network Strategies Operator Survey, uh, an annual survey that we do is produced by Light Reading and was published just, uh, just ahead of MWC. Uh, and specifically within that, it's a, it's a larger project with a number of sections. Um, specifically, we're going to be digging into the 5G transport network results today, and Francisco will be helping me parse through the uh, the findings. Uh, one of the areas we looked at was network slicing, um, kind of a perennial topic, uh, but we wanted to get the latest read from the market on uh, on network slicing for transport networks. And this year, we asked uh, we asked operators about their preferred approaches for transport network slicing. Um, among the options that we gave them, segment routing, MPLS, um, came through as the most established today by far. 42% uh, of respondents reporting SR MPLS, which is soft slicing um, option already in use in their networks. But looking out over the next two years, the respondents uh, noted that um, SRV6 is going to come on strong uh, within two years, 42%. Expecting to adopt uh, segment routing v6 SRV6 for transport slicing. So um, quite a quite a, um, a strong finding there, Francisco. What do, what do you think about um, the results on MPLS and, and SRV6, as well as just any any other um, findings that that you saw from from the network slicing question? Yes, yeah, Sterling. It's pretty impressive. I mean that both SRMPLS and SRV6 have such a good engagement from operators, many of them, I mean, 42% SRMPLS and 29% SRV6 are ready in use. And when you put together the, the the ones that are planning to deploy it in the next two years, both of them are in the 70s percent. So you see quite widespread plans or, or already uh, engagements, investments in, in SR and SRV6. This is well aligned with what we're seeing here in the market. And it's quite interesting interesting in this topic because we talked a lot about uh, network slicing a few years ago. It was one of the big, biggest enablers of the 5G promise. So there was lots of expectations there, uh, a lot of hype and expected inflations, uh, inflated expectations, I'm sorry. And, and then there was this, this disillusion with the technology i would say that in 2023 most of our customers were not really involved in in slicing deployments or not really interested in talking about slicing but now we are seeing a big resurgence of the topic with lots of strength and sr became very popular most of our customers are doing some sort of sr implementation many are starting with sr mpls but srv6 is also becoming very popular and what's interesting that it's not only for slicing, it's also for overall IP performance enhancement, leveraging SR for better traffic engineering in general, and it's also for better network resilience. So different aspects of SR deployment. And this popularity of SR combined with the, the investments in 5G standalone that we also can see in the survey when we put it together, it kind of build a very strong case for concrete slice advancement, advancements moving forward. So it seems that now we have a very good traction for slicing. Soft slicing, of course, with SR and SR6 is leading the wave, but we also see some good conversations and initiatives by leveraging Flexi for, for hard slicing, and it shows also in the research. So there is a lot going on here and a big shift in the behavior of operators with regards to slicing. So it seems good news to, to the market in general. Yeah, it does. And it's a little bit of a, well, we've been here before, but I, I think you make a good point. As we look at, at the industry five years ago, I, I think, I, I know, 
um, slicing was overpromised uh, from the simple fact that the technologies, underlying technologies, really weren't there to, to make it real on the radio side. The combination of the 5G standalone core and then um, and and just the uh, the functionality of, of the radio standards uh, them, themselves. And now, as we move into 2024, we're, we're seeing those things coming into place in the network so that you can actually do slicing. Uh, I do suspect that um, we'll, we'll see a, a lot more real deployments moving forward. Um, but, you know, the industry is a little bit scarred, I, I think, uh, from, from some of the overpromising uh, from the whole industry, you know, ourselves as analysts included. Uh, let me uh, go to a, another topic here. Um, from the from the survey, uh, cell side gateways really kind of the, the workhorse of the, of the 5G network, and we asked about the importance of of a number of attributes for next generation cell site um, routers, uh, cell site gateways, um, and looking at those results, energy efficiency topped the list of attributes that are considered critical. Uh, just looking at the numbers, 38 percent of the operators surveyed globally said that's a, a critical feature. Um, Maybe not a surprise, but do you want to talk through what 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 you saw? Um, energy efficiency, maybe it's quite obvious, but um, you know why why is this such a big one uh, for the cell site router? Yeah, that's quite interesting as well because these questions show that things like energy efficiency, outdoor mount, weatherproof mm -hmm. platforms, even shallow depth for street cabinets, temperature harder, all of those score pretty well in terms of of features that operators are prioritizing and looking at. And it, it, it resonates with what we are seeing and hearing from the market. And from what I'm I'm seeing from the market, it, it seems that it's the case that there is a lot of cell site diversification going on. Uh, a lot of experimentations or uh, with small cells, all sorts of rooftop cells, wall-mounted, radios, pole-mounted, strand-mounted, uh, a lot of pressure in the cell sites with regards to making, it's not only energy savings because of sustainability or because of costs. Yes, it is, but it's also trying to keep up with the, the pressure on the overall cell site and cell environment, space, power, and cooling. So we are hearing more and more operators asking for alternatives for support to avoid retrofitting cell sites, to avoid uh, any kind of construction work at the cell site. And that means that they need right-sized cell site routers, that they need uh, outdoor mounted, strand mounted, they need uh, to avoid any cooling impact. Uh, so as an example, Sienna has been responding to that by diversifying our, our x hall router portfolio. So in the last, couple of years, we have launched several platforms, uh, some smaller platforms, very compact outdoor platforms. All of our platforms are, are temperature harder, uh, outdoor platforms with outdoor enclosures. So a lot of flexibility so that operators can navigate these different cell site environments, different cell site scenarios, and kind of, of build something that is tailor-made to their environment and that's not going to put additional pressure. So when I look at the questions and the answers, it seems to resonate with everything that we are seeing that th there is a lot new in terms of cell site to respond to all uh, densification requirements to, to the new spectrum introduction uh, and the market, the transport market needs to, to enable that and to cope with these new requirements. Yeah, do you see, um... Yeah, the, the outdoor uh, was interesting to me, the outdoor mountable platforms and temperature hardened. You can see that these are, uh, you know, certainly being deployed in, in non, I don't know, CO type of environments. Does that indicate that uh, operators are anticipating like like new new builds, um, a lot of greenfield type or or uh, is there is something else behind the this outdoor interest is it just simply a, a way to upgrade stuff that's that's been deployed before in 4G? I think it's a mix. It's hard to generalize in this because it's very dependent on the region. But mm -hmm. I would say that yes, there are new some millimeter wave initiatives, some densification even for mid band that is requiring new cell sites and new small cells and different formats of cells. Yes, that there is display. 
but there is also introduction of additional components in existing cell sites and macro, mac, even macro cell sites. And those are requiring some more creative approach to make sure that they they can be very effective in, in their investments and, and, and not put additional pressure in these in the sites and uh, do this in the most cost-effective, both from a CapEx and OpEx perspective, most cost-effective way. Yeah, I think cost-effective is a big a big theme of 2024, maybe 2025, uh, as, as well as, as a lot of operators are digesting a lot of money spent over the past several years around 5G. Um, Let's go through one more question from from the uh, from, from the survey, um, and there were many interesting ones. But let's focus on the uh, kind of a, a more general one. We asked operators about uh, a number of different five G transport related technologies, um, gauging their relative importance for for, for operators. And uh, in this one, edge user plane function the UPF uh, technology topped the list, forty four percent of operators saying they're very interested in it and uh, definite plans to deploy. I mean, it's, it's got the word edge in it, uh, but edge is kind of come and gone and maybe coming back as, as a buzzword. What, what do you think of uh, of that particular finding? And then the, actually the other one that was interesting in that was a lot of interest in, in high-speed pawns for uh, for mid-haul backhaul. Uh, but maybe start with the the, uh, the edge user plane. Um, yeah. Why, edge. yeah. Yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, Edge has has been quite hyped, and that there's a lot of interest in that. That there, there's there continues to be a lot of interest in that. Maybe even with all the hype around AI and what might be the impact in the Edge, but also I see there is a concern on how to monetize the the telco Edge and and bring more efficiency to the network deployments as well. Try to bring better experience to the users with lower latency applications and things like that. So of course there is is an area that drags a lot of attention specifically when we talk about edge acceleration there are some initiatives some concerns on trying to leverage control and user plane separation and push the the upf closer to the edge as an example we are engaging with several providers and operators uh, looking at uh, alternatives to to leverage the existing compute of transport routers their asics to do to deploy an UPF over the router and and kind of do this in a more efficient, in, in a better way and more cost efficient way than actually needing a, a dedicated appliance at the edge or doing this with a, a more complex cloud uh, approach. So those are things that can help accelerate the edge in a very cost efficient way. And I think there's a lot of traction around these discussions. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I would also mention you, you talked about PON as an alternative for backhaul transport, for X-haul transport in general. Yeah. We are also seeing a lot of interest with, in that. Not a lot of deployments yet, but it's getting more and more traction. And we that's something that we are quite well positioned and, and seeing good, good uh, conversations with customers because of our approach or more convergent approach where all of our x hall platforms are capable of uh, hosting micro OLT plugs. And this lands this, the platform, the transport platform that is already supporting a micro cell site or any x hall environment is capable of seamlessly supporting pond transport. So it seems that uh, this kind of deployments, this kind of, of solutions will become more popular in the next year or so. And we are very attentive to that. Yeah, I agree. Sienna has invested uh, quite a bit over the past few years in in, in PON and the access networks, um, even in some some acquisitions as, as well. So it seems like uh, well well thought out strategy there, based on on what we're seeing just in the survey here. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, just the the typical fixed network uh, stuff aside. So yeah, looking forward to that. Um, we are running out of time. Uh, let me ask. Um, Anything else from the survey? Uh, we did have a number of questions in there. Uh, we're not going to get to them all. Uh, any other just uh, big picture findings uh, from the survey you want to share with the audience? Yeah, one topic really quickly is the timing and synchronization. It's it's clearly something very critical for service providers. It sh shows very high level of critical and important for all of the topics around timing and synchronization. And that's very much in line with what we're hearing hearing from the markets everyone wants to look at this to increase 5g performance to increase network resilience 
the other topic was around uh, rent centralization and front hall packetization. Uh, it continues to grow. It's been uh, somewhat a longer journey than we initially expected, but it continues to take traction. And I think it's quite aligned with the trend of operators looking for more efficient ways to deploy their networks, focusing on how they can make the most of the, their capital expenditures and, and focus on the cost efficiency for the next couple of years. All right, uh, so now we are we are out of time, but I, I wanna thank you, Francisco, for your insights today and also uh, for all your help uh, putting together this year's survey and actually I think last year's as well. So um, really interesting pro uh, projects. Thanks, thanks a lot, Francisco. Thank you, Sterling. And for listeners, the full survey report is titled 5G Network Strategies Operator Survey, and it can be found on the Light Reading website if you search under the white papers section um, and for further help finding it, it was published on February 23rd. So again, just, just heading into MWC. Um, and if you're hearing this podcast series for the first time, please check out this and past episodes at the Light Reading website, www.lightreading.com. Thanks everyone for listening.